All right, in this video, we want to talk about how natural selection affects single gene and polygenic trait. But we already talked about that on Friday, so we'll do a quick review of that. And our main focus is going to be the three types of selection for polygenic traits. Um, so first, let's do a review. For single gene traits, uh, at the beginning, uh, you can see a distribution of the single gene trait. Remember, for single gene trait, there are two differences between that and the polygenic. The first one is that single gene trait is a trait that's controlled by only one gene. And then the second one is when you look at the phenotype of the single gene trait, you would have two or three or four distinct phenotypes instead of a range of phenotypes. You have very distinct phenotypes. As an example, in this picture, the initial population can have three different types of phenotypes. And you have a percentage or a number of each uh, phenotype, right? 80%, 10%, and 10%. As time goes on, this percentage changes, which leads to evolution. So we went from 80%, 10%, and 10% to the generation 30 have 40 and 60 due to natural selection. And, and this is the result of evolution. So this is how natural selection act on single gene trait. You have an initial number, you have an initial very distinct few characteristics, and then the distribution of that characteristics or the percentage changes. Natural selection on polygenic trait is a little bit different from the single gene trait. So at the beginning of a population, first off, you instead of seeing very few distinct traits, you have a whole range of traits. So as an example, right here we have the beak depth, which is the trait that we're trying to look at. And this beak depth ranges from 6 to 14. So instead of only having a beak depth of 6 and 10 and 14, for example, you have any number in between 6 and 14. And for each of this number, the deep beak depth of 6, 7, 8, 9, 9.3, 9.5, 9.7, and so on, you would have um, a number of finches that have that corresponding beak depth. Or you can have a percentage. In this picture, we have number of finches. So as an example, um, say 11, if, uh, how many finches within this population have the beak depths of 11? If you look up, it's about 10. So we have 10 finches. So this picture shows you the distribution of this polygenic trait uh, within this population. So, uh, so a natural selection can affect the relative fitness of phenotypes and thereby produce one of three types of selection. So this is this picture shows you the initial, this picture right here shows you the initial um, distribution of the beak depth. But there's three ways that they can change depending on what exactly happened within this um, population. So here are the three possible ways um, that this initial distribution can change. The uh, directional selection, stabilizing selection, and disruptive, so disruptive selection. The first one is directional selection. So the word directional tells you that it goes to a certain direction, right? So if you look at this curve right here, this dotted curve is the distribution of the initial population, which looks pretty similar to what we have right here, right? This is not as clean of a graph because no data is perfect, but it looks somewhat like a bell curve. So this is our initial uh, distribution of the characteristic. We have the short tail. Uh, so right here we're talking about this lizard. We have short tail lizards. We have medium tail lizard. We have lizards with really long tail. And which type of lizard has a, does our population have the most? We have the most of the medium. So if you look up, right, this uh, y-axis is not labeled, the y-axis should be either the number or the percentage. So the medium size tail, medium length tail will have, um, is the predominant one within this population. So as time goes on, uh, this scenario happened. Long wiggly tails look like a snake and scare predators. The longer tail, uh, the tail, the more it looks like a snake. So predators would know that snakes are dangerous. So if this um, lizard is representing a snake, 
then it might fight off the predators, which means this lizard might not be eaten by the predators because it looks like a snake. So as time goes on, the lizards with the shorter tail tend to get eaten by the predators, and then the, the, uh, the lizards with the longer or the medium long tails uh, get to live because they look like a snake. So the result of that is after, over time, natural selection act on this population and the, the individuals with a shorter tail are less fit than the ones with medium long. So as a result, this bell curve, this original bell curve, shifts toward this side, shift toward the longer side uh, of the, the range, right? We have short to long, this is the range of characteristic, but this characteristic shifts. So now, most of our population would have a medium long tail rather than the initial medium tail, and uh, there's no short tail anymore. We have some medium short tail, we have some really long tail, but we we uh, don't really have any of the short tail anymore. So now we call this a direct directional selection because this bell shifts and the characteristic within this population shifts toward a certain um, extreme. So, it's, so in this case, we shift toward the long extreme, the right extreme, okay? Uh, this next one, if, if you don't quite get it, um, I'm going to show you a different video at the end of my video so you can watch that and hopefully you'll understand it a little better. This next one is called stabilizing selection. Stabilizing selection, uh, if you just look at the curve itself, originally we have medium, uh, medium length tail for this, what is this animal? A cat, I guess, for this cat. Um, and for the medium tail, we have... Um, most of the population have the medium tail, let's say 50%. And then a little bit of the population has the short tail and a little bit of the population has the long tail. As time goes on, the scenario in this case is that short tail messes up the cat's balance, which, is, which makes the cat less fit. Long tails drag on the ground, which also makes the cat less fit. Medium tails are the best. Medium tail is the most fit. So as time goes on, because medium tail is the most fit and short and long are not that fit, which means they cannot reproduce and survive as well as the medium tail. So the result of that is some of the short tail cats die off, some of the long tail cats die off, and most of the population would end up having the medium tail, which is the same as it was before, right? At the beginning, when you look at the dotted, uh, dotted curve, most of the population also have the medium but it could have been 50% of the population had the medium tail. But in the end, you might have 75% of the population having the medium tail. So we call this stabilizing selection. You have the same type of distribution as it was before, except the one in the middle, uh, you get more of that characteristic at the end of the selection. All right, this last one is called disruptive selection. If you look at this curve itself, the characteristic that you can notice is that originally we have this normal bell curve, uh, but at the end, you get more of the, um, the shorter tail, more of the longer tail, but you get a lot less of the medium tail. All right, so both extremes, uh, both extremes, the short and the long, are better than the medium. So as an example, uh, we have this squirrel population. Short tails keep the predators from catching you on the ground, so, so shorter tail is more fit. Long tails are good for balance in the trees. Longer tail is also more fit. Medium tail don't help. Medium tail is not fit. So the result is that natural selection is going to select for the shorter tail and the longer tail, but not the medium tail. So the distribution changes where the percentage of squirrels with medium tail goes down, but the percentage of shorter tail goes up, and longer tail also goes up because short and long are more fit. Okay, digest that for a second, and then we're going to go over the notes uh, for this part, uh, for these three types of selection. All right, the first one is called directional selection. 
um, just real quick, what you want to do instead of memorizing the notes, what you really need to do is to understand these three graphs, being able to match these three graphs with the name, and really understand what's going on in this graph and what causes it. Okay, so remember the graph and be able to interpret it and be able to explain what happens, why this curve shifts the way it does. All right, so directional selection. The cause of the directional selection is individual, individuals at one end of the curve have higher fitness than individuals in the middle or at the other end. Okay, so if you think about it, we have a curve. At one end is either the left end or the right end is more fit than the other side of the curve. So as an example, if you were uh, to talk about the bird beak, big beak birds were more fit after a drought, which made, uh, oh, okay, sorry. Big beak birds were more fit after a drought made small seeds, scars, and death in nature. Okay, so after the drought, the, we didn't have any more of the small seeds, so the birds with small beaks or medium beaks were not as fit as the birds with big beaks. So the result of that is the average beak size increases. The curve shifts to one side of the curve. Which side? The side with the bigger beak. So uh, this is similar to what we, uh, what we just talked about. So as an example, we have these uh, mouse, these mice of different colors. If the darker color is more fit than the other ones, this, then this curve is going to shift toward the right, where more of the population is going to have the darker color. And the average, kind of in the middle ones, the average is also going to shift um, towards this side, where you have the darker mouse. All right, this next one is called stabilizing selection. The cause is individuals near the center of the curve have higher fitness than individuals at either end. For example, human infants who have an average weight is usually more healthy and easier to be born, thus increasing fitness. So human babies who have a really low weight uh, is, is not as healthy sometimes, and those with really uh, heavy weight are harder to be born, which might also uh, lower the fitness of the human baby. So having a medium um, weight is more fit. So the result of that is more of the population of human beings will have the close to average trait, the close to average weight in this case, and the curve narrows. So uh, in this picture, it shows you kind of the same thing, but, but it's the curve that's important. We have the blue one, which is the original population, and then the red one, where the average increases the average well the average didn't increase but the distribution of the average the percentage of the population that has the average increases last one disruptive selection the cause is individuals at the outer end of the curve have higher fitness than the individuals near the middle of the curve for example a bird population lives at an island with only small or large seeds but no medium seed so the result is uh, having small beaks is better, having large seed is, uh, having large beak is better, but having medium beak is less fit than the other two. So the result is the single curve is going to split into two. It kind of forms a camelback kind of, kind of curve, and the curve bends in the middle. So in this example, we have a whole bunch of butterflies of different color. Having the, having the lighter color uh, skin color is better. Having the dark color is also better, but having the medium color is not good, is less fit. So the, as time goes on, um, this original population is uh, going to change where we have less of the medium butterfly and we will have more of the lighter and the darker um, individuals. So here's your review. Think about how does nitro selection affect single gene and polygenic traits? Remember, there were two differences between single gene and polygenic traits. And um, for single gene, it only changes one way. And for polygenic, there are three ways that natural selection can act on it. How do the curves look like? 
um, what really changes during the curve, what can cause this specific selection.